There we go. All right. Welcome back, gentlemen. Another episode of BGO's Blind Pig from bgobsession.com. Uh, real quick introductions. Top left, that's Neo, known as Bob. Bottom left is Ohm, known as Mark. Bottom right is Boone, known as John. Top right is Paul. The uh, the Canadian wonder, the Canadian hog. He's the uh, the wonder from up yonder. And I am Silent Threat, uh, also Derek. So if anybody tracks us down on the board, if we somehow scare one of you guys to join us, you know, please jump on and in involve yourself. Real quick, I wanted to touch on something. And uh, before we started talking, before I hit record, and I realized that two of the people on here at least had no idea what I was talking about. So I'd like to get a live reaction. Um, and then we can move on to some football. But seven hours ago, Adam Schefter tweeted, Raiders owner Mark Davis told reporters today that he would like the NFL to provide a written report of its findings on its investigation of the culture, the Washington football team. Um, this is the first time somebody from the inner circle has spoken out asking for, for some sort of documentation. Despite what Goodell said not more than 24 hours ago when he said, they have levied a, a substantial punishment with a, uh, with a large fine and that Dan Snyder hasn't been around the team for four months and that the, the, uh, the punishment absolutely met the standard and what they believed was adequate. This is an owner of an NFL franchise speaking out. His coach got fired in the backlash of this. The guy he's paying $10 million a year to. Didn't tag, didn't tags, tag me, boo. I'm dating myself. Didn't the commissioner come out and say that they're not going to turn over the report? Didn't he also say that? They did. This came out after that, yeah. which is why I find it interesting. So my real quick take is if anyone other than Mark Davis, I might take it more seriously. I think that guy's a bit of a, I don't know. I don't want to say, I don't know the man, but he doesn't strike me as a, as a heavyweight. If it had come from Robert Kraft, I might feel a little bit differently. To me, this is nothing until it turns into something. If we start hearing eight other owners start to chirp up, then yeah. If it's just Mark Davis out there, I, I think he's trying to divert attention from what happened with his club. Well, first of all, I want to say that Roger Goodell is a spineless worm, and he makes me want to quit watching the NFL. He makes me want to quit buying um, swag from the NFL, and he really pisses me off because – I mean, this is a guy that that uh, was able to um, inspire a 250 page report on how much air was in Tom Brady's football and who put it there. But you have <laughs> accusations of cheerleaders, uh, soft porn videos of cheerleaders getting uh, made for the owner with his favorite music on board. You have multiple women um, claiming, you know, misogyny and sexual harassment. And those are only the ones that have spoken up. And, um, and, and he's, and we're supposed to be so stupid as to believe that there's nothing to see here. I, I think that guy's a pig. I think he's, um, a shill and I hope he goes down with, with Dan Snyder. I'm highly skeptical because of how, how things work in America that, um, a damn thing is going to happen. <clears throat> I know it's a good thing that another owner, um, sp spoke up and said something actually, you know, uh, positive or responsible, although he did say the victims, he did use the air quotes as he said it. So that, that kind of made me cringe a little bit. It's like, it's not the victims. It's a bunch of women who said they were, you know, had the shit harassed out of them for the duration of their employment, but it is good that he spoke up what 29 more to go. <laughs> I mean, I just don't, I think these guys are a bunch of old for the most part, old out of touch, um, not very high character people who are probably as worried about what's going to come out about them if there's any transparency at all. Um, so I don't know. People are like, why get Congress involved? It's like, because there, I mean, who else, is there any hope of, of any of, of the facts actually coming to light uh, if it's not Congress? And I'm highly skeptical that's going to, they say Congress like it's the entire Congress holding session. It's uh, what, two Democratic Congress people that have expressed interest in three three i heard three today john so, would you, i'm just curious and i'm not trying to set you up would you favor having the report released to the public in its entirety oh yeah i, I think the big the big lie that goodell is trying to sell us on right now is that 
oh, he's protecting the women because the women didn't want to be um, revealed. Who, who well, you know, every every everyone in America knows what the word redacted means now, right? I mean, <laughs> they can redact the names and not not only that, but the majority of those women have come out and said they want the report to be released. And by the way, the report that were, that Goodell says he has no plans to release, he denied even existed a couple of months ago, right? There was no report. It was an oral presentation. So right. now he's forgotten about that lie and he's moved on to the next lie, which is he, it, it's all about protecting these poor young women's identities. Which is of- Wait, do we have confirmation there is actually a written report at this point in time? I, I have not. If we do, I, I totally missed that news flash. Here's all right. Let me see if I can pull up Goodell. So, the, the 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 beginning of the report was, if you remember, the sports junkies leaked that they got a couple pages off of this recommendation of this report, and it was going to end that Snyder should be removed from his ownership. Mm-hmm. And they said, um, they said there was no written report that there was a uh, that, that it was an oral presentation. And then I'm trying. Let me see if I can find the exact quote. Because what makes it even worse is, well, not worse, what makes it even more hypocritical is that I believe the, the, in Goodell's quote, he, he references that it was, that there was a, a report that was in a summary that was reviewed by Wilkerson. So she, where's that? She's a top. She's a top attorney in D.C. There's no way that Beth Wilkinson doesn't produce every no paper trail. Of, you I mean, can imagine. They, they may have said, "Oh, we don't need that." Beth, <laughs> you hold on to that for us. But I guarantee you, there is documentation of what she found in Wilkinson. Sorry, Wilkinson. Let's see. Um, and like I said, he seems to have forgotten that he denied there was a report because yeah. now he's talking about he's not going to release a report. I sadly i'm 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 torn between being elated that someone in the quote unquote inner circle although we're kidding ourselves if there aren't layers of circles within the within the ownership you know group right um some of these guys are are closer to the to the center than others there's no question about that um but i you know i'm torn between the fact that one of the 32 has called for it to be released and the fact that it's probably the most unstable franchise in the NFL calling for it. Um, you know, I, Washington's been a dumpster fire for 20 years. There's no question about that. But I don't know that there's a more schizophrenic, erratic franchise in, in, in professional sports than the L.A., Oakland, Las Vegas Raiders. I mean, and Mark Davis is the son of Al Davis, who is the original nut job genius. I mean, seriously, the yeah, dude not, was, I think I think that apple fell pretty far though when I when I listened to and watched Mark Davis speak. You're and right. I, I'm no, not about tearing him pretty, down, but it fell pretty far to the nut job side, not the genius side, is the yeah. problem. I think right. Yeah. And and so the voice that's calling for this is not the most. Well, you said it, Mark. If this were Bob Kraft, it'd be a completely different matter, right? Bob Kraft, Jerry Jones, um, one of the Hunt, Mara. Mark Hunt. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, hey, but- Jerry Jones said Jerry Jones was quoted as saying, "We, uh, we're all fine. I speak for everyone. We're all fine with what was done with the information and the punishment that was levied." Of course, out. he is. Um, and by the way, it wasn't like all the owners. My understanding is that it wasn't all the owners got together, like you, as you were alluding to. Bob, all the owners got together and had lengthy conversations about what to do about Washington's embarrassing, you know, history um, and what to do with Dan Snyder. Apparently it was, uh, to use Mark Davis's, uh, it was a handful of owners <laughs> who discussed it and decided what the punishment would be. So, I mean, I think that's probably included guys like Jerry Jones, who has his own, you know, I mean, Google Jerry Jones and young women and he's got his own history out yeah. there. Here's the quote. It said, despite increasing pressure for the league to, the re- to release more info, Goodell cited anonymity as a reason to, uphold, to withhold the full report. Quote, there was a summary of the findings Goodell told reporters during a news conference that Tuesday. We had an independent counsel look at that. Beth and her team, they worked on it almost a year and I think interviewed roughly 150 people 
and I think close to 6 million docs, documents they worked through. So, okay, well, then what the heck is a report? You know what I'm saying? So they, they make it seem like there was literally no paper. There was nothing on paper. There was no hard copy of anything. And then now he's referencing it when he's saying, well, we have to keep people anonymous. Meanwhile, <laughs> the attorney for 22 of the women was on the radio this morning, and she said, we don't want anonymity. We want justice. We want responsibility. All of my clients are perfectly willing to testify. And they're not worried if you know who they are at this point. Hey, all Dan Snyder has to do is call up all the women that he's paid off in non-disclosure agreements and um, and take that off the table. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that's going to happen any minute now. If they want, if they're really worried about that, there's plenty of people that, you know, uh, if you want to, if you want to remove the restrictions on them to, for being um, coming out and speaking, honestly, you can just get rid of, you know, just cancel out all those non-disclosure agreements, Dan, right. and I'm sure they'll come out of the woodwork. Well, let's, so let's, let's watch over the next week or so and see if Davis just is, is he's the only guy waving the flag. If other owners start following, then the story builds and then there's some actual pressure right now. It's just the one guy. Um, before I forget, I've been meaning to ask Paul, is this playing at all outside of the beltway here in DC? I uh, no. So on Canadian sports broadcasting, you will not hear a peep in regards to any of these stories currently. It's, it's basically non-existent. Anything that I hear about it and any news that I read in regards to uh, this topic is all through social media. It's all through uh, different news outlets that I follow online in regards to the NFL. Um, but it is rarely, if ever, talked about here in Canada right now. Not a lot of outrage about... No, the, the, no the other, that, that's right. The, the other thing that I just want to make a quick comment on in regards to Mark Davis and what he said, I might be uh, dissecting his words possibly a little bit too much. Um, but when he was asked, I watched and listened to the sound clip today uh, of when he was asked by reporters if he would like to see the findings of the report released. The thing that caught my attention is he used the word probably. Probably, I would like to see them come out, was essentially what he, what, what he said. Nice hedge. What, 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 what I want to hear is I want to hear an emphatic yes. You know, he didn't sound very convincing. It almost sounded like he was sitting there and just basically giving them the answer that they wanted to hear without necessarily truly believing the words that were coming out of his mouth. Oh, could so, speak. Exactly. It's a strange dude, man. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Uh, people are going to, after the sponsors now, asking for their help. Um, but that dwindled. It's two weeks ago, and then now this. So I'm not saying that I think it's going to do anything, but Congress is involved, and now somebody on the inner circle has at least referenced an interest in knowing what was actually said. Now, whether or not they say that or they write it off as, well, you know, that's because your $100 million coach just got jettisoned. That's your only rooting interest in this situation. You don't actually care. You just are mad that your guy got fired because of it. I guess we can hey, look at it either way. Hey, Mark, I'll add this as well in regards to the question that you asked me. Uh, it just popped in my head now. Um, the, the huge story here is the sexual misconduct that took place within the Chicago Blackhawks NHL organization. In, interestingly enough, they just released the findings of a report that uh, was produced in an investigation that was done in regards to sexual misconduct happening uh, within or their organization in 2010. You can go online, you can go on the team website, you can read all the disgusting and uh, horrible details about the misconduct that took place there that what's is that the website i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's the story that's taking the headlines here in canada um mm. and i just find it interesting that you know there's another organization another sports team that has put out all this information and here we are hiding behind the curtain so to speak i wonder if that situation uh which is somewhat similar happening within another professional sports organization will have any bearing or impact on what is happening with the, with the same, football team. 
same ownership group in place today that was in place 10 years ago when this all happened in Chicago? Do we know? I, I, I want to say yes, uh, but I also Didn't want he, to um, add- just step down? Yeah, well, yeah, some, some of their higher ups within the organization did step down yesterday with the uh, release of the findings. Hey, what, if Dan Snyder steps down tomorrow and sells the team, the report will come out. There will be a push for it. Yeah, right so, now there's- so not to, be, not to beat on Mrs. Snyder, but I thought it was interesting that apparently at the NFL uh, meeting today, she apologized not to the women who feel like they were abused, but she apologized for creating so much trouble for the NFL owners, the other NFL owners. So that, that tells you where um, the Snyder's head is at right now. She's flailing about, man. She just, she is not ready for prime time. No. You know what I mean? She did. Uh, anyway. Anyway. No. It's a good I, thing I have we have a. Idea. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead no, I was going to say, I, I have no clue. I have no clue what her background is other than the fact that she's married to Dan. But this feels very hasty. And she feels. It feels like she's overwhelmed by this. There was no preparation at all in the years leading up to this for her to step up and be co-CEO of the company. That was never part of the plan. And, and the more I watch her, the more I realize from a business perspective, this was a quick and dirty patch that they threw on the hole in the dam well, this when is... they found out that Dan was going to get suspended. Can't argue with that. And she doesn't have people, she doesn't have good people helping her and handling her either. No, no, the team isn't doing her any favors. No. Yeah. All right. Well, it's a good no, thing we're putting a winning product on the field to distract us from all this. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk about that product on the field. Uh, I, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Uh, let me get your guys' reaction, and I'll see. In... You're switching to whiskey for this part. <laughs> I'm already. Cheers. Um, I saw some good things this weekend, actually, uh, and. I'm surprised to say that, but uh, I think I saw a defense that actually put the team in a position to win a football game and the offense ish kind of let them down. I don't know. What do you guys feel? Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Yes. yes. For how many times were we inside the 10 and came away with nothing? I mean, it every time. A, <laughs> this, is, this is a game. How many times? Every single damn time. This is a game that Washington could have won by 10 points. If they had if they had maxed out on scoring opportunities, I would love to have seen this game happen with Logan Thomas healthy and available with Curtis Samuels healthy and available with the right side of the offensive line or even just one of those guys. Logan Thomas might have been might have made a difference in that game. Here's, here's we, my rebut to that. Here's my rebut to that is we were six inches short of a touchdown and a Terry McLaurin drop that he does not drop. And now he's got two in two games. He went 190 pass attempt uh, targets without a drop, and now he's got two drops. Dude, in two games. we we had no punts in this game. All right, I'm just gonna, I'm going to run down a couple stats. That's this happened what gotta... four times in the last ten years or something. <laughs> yeah, we so we we um we, these are the categories we won. First downs we won. Total yards we won convincingly. Rushing we tr tr almost quadrupled their rushing yards. Uh, we almost doubled their yards per rush. Um, we had an edge five minute five or six minute edge in time of possession. It sounds great, right? Sounds like a big win. Uh, and Taylor Heineke, believe it or not, despite the errors, his numbers, except for touchdowns, his numbers are almost identical to Aaron Rodgers. So if you'd have told, if I'd have told you all that before you watched the game, Hey, this is what you're going to have. You'd have thought we, we, we win this Either game. Either a W or a, a, a last minute field goal loss or something. But when you go, when you don't, when you don't punt the entire game, and you only managed 10 points. You, you're zero for zero in the red zone. <laughs> they weren't that much better. They were two for four, but, they, but zero for zero. And then the other thing is, um, not only did, we get, did Heineke get picked off, which I don't really think that, or excuse me, the interception was bad, but um, we also gave up four fumbles. We only, we only um, lost one of those fumbles. So it could have been a lot worse, but um, those, just, those turnovers killed us. And I do want to talk about the, the rush to the end zone and then the play after that at some point. But 
we really, I wasn't mad at the end of this game. And then maybe part of that could have been, I was so mad the week before I didn't have anything left. I don't know. I didn't pace myself <laughs> with my rage, but I think because they moved the ball all over the field and the defense looked pretty good. Um, the one thing I'll say, and then I'll let you guys chime in. Um, I know we've been, the uh, offensive line's been getting all kinds of props, a lot of props over the last two to three weeks about how good they are and they're the only uh, you know unit that's performing. But they weren't great in this game. Um, he got sacked four times, and I want to say he got touched nine times. And I know part of that is on Heineke not getting rid of the ball or, or, or holding on to it too long to make something happen. But he was under a lot of pressure in that game, Heineke was. Yeah. Um, I, I, the fumbles scare me, and I'm not going to lie. Gibson's starting to worry me a little bit. If, you, yeah. if we're being completely honest, he's starting to have the old the yips. He's having the um oh Jesus, who was the running back that could never hold on to the ball? I don't know. He's not in the league anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Are you thinking of that? Oh no, it's it's Gruden's third round pick, Matt Matt Jones. Oh Jones, yeah. Was it Jones that yep. fumbled every third time he touched the football? Um well, running backs go through that. Remember when we said Stephen Davis wasn't going to make I, it because yeah, he do. fumbled I, I all early. I mean, I they go, they go through it. I'm, I agree. Yeah, that's a concern now, and he needs to, he needs to go Tiki Barber and find a, a you know, figure out a way to hold on to the rock. Um, if well, just on Gibson, who I love, and I think he's still learning to play running back. Mm -hmm. He makes some cuts that make me crazy. He's so good at seeing the field. And kind of has this fluid way of, of making cuts. They're not sharp cuts. They're fluid. But every once in a while, he makes a decision on a cut or pick a lane that I just, looking at it from up top, you're like, oh, my God, it's all opened up on the left, and he'll veer right. It only happens a couple of times a game. But I've seen that in him. Um, just my quick take on the game. We, you could go over this game and over it and over it and over it. And it came down to me to about four trips where normally we we've been pretty good in the red zone. I think I don't have the stats to back it up, but I was pretty confident that we were going to score on a couple of those drives. And this was kind of a fluky game, right? You got Taylor going down and giving himself up stupidest rule in the history of, of football, which, you know, letter of the law. Yeah. He didn't get it. And then there's a fluky fumble play after that. One thing I haven't heard anybody else talk about, there were at least two passes on two of those possessions that Taylor threw into the end zone where he threw high and a little bit late and the balls didn't get caught. Both guys were open. There was one down inside the 10, another deep sort of middle pass. He was high on a lot of passes in this game that I think it might have even been different had he been lower on some of those. But if you think about all the game, all the missed opportunities down in the red zone, um, I'm not saying we would have won the game, but this should have scared the Packers a hell of a lot more. I, By the way, you know what? Um, I had to look this up today. Aaron Rodgers' record in home games during his career. He's 81, 19, and 1. Wait, wait. Paul That's can one-up that. <laughs> no, not yet. I'll, I'll save it for later. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. He's just holding the cards. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to I, ask you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, all, all I wanted to say is those, th those two goal line plays, um to me they basic they basically summed up almost 30 years of futility for us in a nutshell if you wanted to say what it's like being a washington football team fan over the last 30 years or so that was it right there to a t it was north That's, turner yeah, all you, over again right it, it, you, you found it was, yourself just I, saying that is such a redskin thing to do so yeah, I, I want to talk about the second of those plays with which one the the, the, fumble, the where he's laying on top yes. of the defender Yes, because I get the first one. I get the first one. If that's the rule, that's a rule. Um, but the second one, I don't understand a couple of things. First of all, I kind of got the feeling that they're like, the official couldn't process what he was seeing. Like, oh, he's not over the line, but now he's dropped the ball. And now he's got the ball again. And now he's lunging. And all the while, you can't see his feet. Well, why in God's name, if you haven't stopped the play, on forward progress, which apparently I haven't heard anyone say, no, they blew the whistle. 
It was still a live play. Why in God's name do you signal no touchdown when everyone in America can see the ball is over the line? Why would you call none? Because then, then we get screwed. Because on replay, what I heard is they couldn't see his feet. Well, you could see the ball go across the end zone line. If you couldn't see his feet, you can't see that he's down. Call it a touchdown. I mean, good God, call it a touchdown. And then if 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 you need to review it, then review it. I, I just don't get that. Well, I thought the rule part that I didn't I didn't understand it until I heard this morning. I think it was this morning on one of the the shows I was watching instead of working. Um, mm. Was when he fumbled initially, and when he recovered it before he extended it out over the end zone. When he recovered it, he was touched by a defender. He's lying on top of a defender. Rule says if it's a fumble and recovered, and you're touching a defender, that's the spot. So Only that's why it down. died. He was he was not if he's not down. I don't no, believe that's the, correct. The rule that they were citing said that if you're if you're touched by a defender after a fumble recovery you're down there. Now, I'm not I'm not saying that's right, but that's what they were saying. So hold on. I think you might be onto something because I think there is a rule that an offensive player cannot advance a fumble. Is that true? Or not his own fumble, I think. Well, that's the old Dave Casper rule, right? I, I don't know. I don't know is the answer, but I think that made sense to me at least. At least in that instance, that's an interpretation of kind of a goofy rule. And at least so I why can... don't we know? It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. What other team has a play like that happen to them? And has no explanation ever given. Like, I, I, I'll tell you what team, Washington. <laughs> Any other team would know. I mean, we, we might be um, bitching about with the explanation, but I haven't heard anything come out. You know, if we if we'd why lost, that <clears throat> if we'd lost by less than seven, John, I think it'd be a bigger story. I agreed. But, but you know, that one play isn't going to solve the problem for us. You know, we're, we, we were three scores from, from winning this game. And so that yeah, one but, play then just becomes one thing. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't feel like the refs did a great job. This wasn't a game that anybody's going to dial up and use as a, as an example of great refereeing in the NFL. Uh, you know, the PI call that, that Adams drew late in the game, I felt like was ticky tack and significantly less contact there than the PI call. They didn't give Washington in the end zone when the, when the green Bay defender, wrapped up seals jones yep. um yep. And there was a lot more contact on ours than there than there was on theirs and yet nobody hesitated to give it to granted it's Devonte adams and we all know that you know stars get a different level of treatment in every league it's not just the nfl it's you know basketball and hockey and guy you know if you're if, if you're lebron james you get calls that that you know the eighth man off the bench for the dallas mavericks is never going to get right um, so, I mean, I do kind of understand that, but the level of the, the level of refereeing, I just, and I, they have one of the hardest games and one of the hardest jobs in sports. And I, I, I would, I don't want to be a referee. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'll tell you what, there were moments when I was coaching kids soccer, I didn't want to be a referee for kids soccer match. Cause periodically you, you have no clue what just happened, but yet you've got to make a ruling on it. And we're talking about 10 year old girls that are moving at a fraction of the speed that, that an NFL player moves at. And these guys are making split second decisions and, and I get it, but, you know, looking at the replay, some of that stuff felt fairly cut and dried to me. I, I, I'm like John, I, and I, I, I desperately want to rag on the, the, the quote unquote give, gave himself up play that, that, that touchdown. I thought I guess incorrectly, that the rule was always if you went feet first, you were down. But used to went, be, I think. But if you went head first, it was a completely different matter. Um, and so I, I don't know. That just well, Mike Pereira was on the radio today, on the radio or on NFL Now or something. He said it's all a judgment call, whether they're giving themselves up or they're lunging for an additional yard. Which it's makes it even matter because no quarterback is giving themselves up. As they Going. rush towards the end zone at the no, one not yard cool. line, <laughs> not, no, not cool. even Alex Smith does that. Correct. Not when so if, they, if it's a judgment call, that makes it insanely them. stupid. But that's even. But that's correct. why it's a judgment call. This okay? There's a judgment call. PI is a judgment call. Holding to an extent is a judgment call. Perception is a judgment call. <laughs> uh huh. 
receptions are a judgment call at some time. Like you're talking about these guys are supposed to be monitoring the rule book and then everything is a judgment call. And I think that's where the big part, the fumble was a judgment call and the judgment changed the play because to like John said, it, had they called that a touchdown, there's no way you overturn it the other direction. Right. But then right. since there they called no it clear... short, there's no way you overturn it to, into a touchdown. It's a judgment call. So at some point, when are we going to look at the judgment? And then they're trying to do this at a thousand miles an hour. So to your point, I don't blame them, but guys are bigger, faster, stronger. But meanwhile, they're trying not to get their own block knocked off because if they're, you know what I'm saying? They're not padded. So God forbid somebody runs into them. So I get it. But and then at the same time, where's I personally, my opinion, any penalty worth more than 15 yards needs to be reviewable. And that includes pass interference. Well, I'd so figure going get... to the college rule. I'd figure make, I'd, I'd, I've always had a problem with spot fouls on PI. It, it's a game changer. Too many games have been lost with a ticky tack PI call that in the end zone that can be a 50 yard penalty and give you a first and goal. It's the co college has that one, right? 15 yards, 15 yards from the line, from the, the line of scrimmage, period. from the line of scrimmage. Yeah. It's a standard foul. I'm gonna, I want to say something that's going to get, going to get my friend Derek all riled up. I bet I'm betting. I thought Scott Turner called an amazing game up with a couple of exceptions. And unfortunately the exceptions <clears throat> Taylor Haneke rushing, <laughs> quarterback sneaking. With a couple of exceptions, we had them off base and one of the better defenses in the league. We had them off base all day long. We ran it down their throat. We ran it 29 times, averaged almost seven yards a rush, which brings to mind the question of why aren't you rushing one of your big run running backs on um, fourth and short instead of Taylor Haneke. But anyway, I, I felt like our offense was clicking on a day when Haneke wasn't perfect. But we had them off base. We were mixing up the pass and the run really well. Um, Green Bay only ran 15 times, um, it just to just as a comparison. We ran it twice as often as Green Bay, and we were behind most, you know, in the second half. So uh, you're not going to get me wound up because I will say Scott Turner called a good enough game that we should have been in that game a lot more. There were plays left on that field. There were executed plays that could have been executed differently. They would have changed the outcome of the game. Now, that doesn't mean a win, but it means the outcome, meaning we could have been playing into the fourth quarter with a three-point deficit. A missed field goal, like I said, a Terry McLaurin dropped touchdown, and then a Heineke sliding at the six-inch yard line were three plays that were not you, – you're not lofty. We were in position to make those plays. The plays were executed, and we beat ourselves. So well, and, Gib and Gibson fumbling inside the five, right? I mean, no, that's no, no, we got that back. Schweitzer got that back. Oh, and by the way, hold on. That's, that's Before right. we move on, not only to Taylor Heineke was... for saving that freaking play 40 yards downfield. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was an amazing play. I, Why I hate nobody's it. talking about that. I don't get because you have to see what, that. Oh, and he, what, he, he broke off and ran for 80 yards. Don't forget about that. Taylor Heineke but, did. I mean, he had 95 yards. He was, you know, I mean, that's the shame of it is. They were, and I know coaches say like it was only like four or five plays. It really was, though. I mean, it, you could really like count down like four or five plays that had we not come out on a terrible losing end of them, we'd we'd have been right. Not in only a terrible losing end of them, had we just executed the play. And it's not a hail mary. Terry McLaurin watched a ball hit him in his face mask. You know what I'm saying? It was not. He's, a he's parallel to the ground. It's not an easy catch, but it's one no. you expect him to make. Agree. You do expect and, him to make it. Yeah. And, and Heineke slid. With nobody around him, if he just stays on his feet, it's a touchdown. If We're he does all, like like they, they all do now, right? They go do this hand it over the goal line thing. It's like we if Tom Brady up, makes that same goal. exact play, do you think that's a touchdown? Yeah. If who does? Speaking of judgment calls, Rogers, Mahomes. If 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 right, I mean, and I don't think that's I don't think of officials get bought off. I don't think they have biases, but I do think there is a natural tendency to have a, a bias a, against better teams and doubt. stars you go to the stars and 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 i'm comfortable saying that because back in the old days when um well the lights just went out <laughs> it's like dude mark where'd you go <laughs> i kind of like this this is a halloween look i'll fix that in a second but back back in the heyday when gibbs was our guy for 13 years 
we got the benefit of all kinds of calls in games. I can remember watching games with buddies who, from other teams who would be so pissed. You guys always get that call. And I, I recognized it for what it was. If we ever get good again, we'll get some benefit of the doubt calls. Let there be light. The other thing I wanted to mention was, uh, had we had we kicked the two field goals instead of going for it, and I have no problem with us going for those mm -hmm. four downs, because I, I like that aggressiveness, especially when you've only won two games and mm -hmm. you're on the road in Green Bay. I liked it that we went for it. However, if we'd have kicked those, we're going for a tie on the last drive, despite it's everything. Drive. It's despite everything. Game. Don't change anything else. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's how close of a game it really was. It's it's misleading. The score does not tell no. the now, story of the game. I was – right, so I've got to – to a certain degree, I have to agree that Scott Turner got kind of, you know, off the snide this week as far as the play calling is concerned until he got inside the five-yard line, inside Correct. the 10-yard line. You know, and his play calling inside the 10-yard line, I just don't understand. You've got – you know, you've got second and goal – well, actually third and goal, I guess, right? Your third and goal, you know you're going to go for it. You know it's four down territory because that's because that's what we do these days, right? So you know it's four down territory, you throw. Why? Then you line up to run, and I think Derek said this on the board, and you, and you line up empty backfield. God. Oh, I With don't your 180 yard quarterback or 180 pound quarterback or two. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I, I, well, the team says 210, but even at 210, <laughs> he's not the guy I want carrying the ball necessarily. Well, right. I just, and you don't, you don't want him on a sneak, get him outside. He has the athleticism to beat almost anybody on the defense to the corner. Not, yeah. Not I take, ex I'm going to take exception to that. Get in the air. If you're going to do that, fly. Get off I the got, Yeah, I take exception to it, right? The, the Bills lost the game this week because Josh Allen, who's, what, seven foot seven, 400 pounds, and runs and leaps like a gazelle, slipped on that same play and went yeah. down short. I, I had no problem with the call. We were, we were what, six inches from the goal line. All you have to do is take the snap and stick it over. I don't know if he slipped, whatever. I was okay with that call. I, if, I, if he makes that touchdown, nobody's even thinking about it. I, I can't figure out how many – how many touchdowns did Joe Theismann score on naked bootlegs, bootlegs. after oh, taking yes. the handoff? And we never do it. I haven't and seen how many play. has Heineke scored? The Not score. in one of those critical situations, though. They just don't do it. I don't know. I don't get it, Bob, because the guy, if nothing else, he, he's either going to score with his feet or someone's going to pop open and they'll hit him. I mean, at you least don't you see that better. call very much anymore. Carson Carson Wentz had one this week. But yeah. you, know, you see maybe one That's, of those every other week in the NFL. It's not I hate a, to re, I hate to reference it, but Dallas used to destroy us on that play. The play um, action boot and the tight end leaks across the field. You got Bates, mm -hmm. you got Seals Jones, who, by the way, not to go on off another tangent, God, if anybody made us forget Logan Thomas, it was J Ricky Seals Jones. Where the hell did that guy come from? And then you, or you got any one of your running backs, JD McKissick, anybody can play out of the backfield. I, I, yeah. I don't like putting him in there in a sneak with an empty backfield. At least put somebody behind him so they have to think about somebody else instead of letting them key. Like, oh, this is, if this isn't a, a run, then who's he going to throw it to? Yeah. I, uh, you know, I just, I don't understand that. But, and I think we spent a lot of time talking about the offense. I, I, I feel like the defense deserves a little bit of love this week, guys. And, and as much as I, I don't know, it calls me a little bit. Anybody know off the top of their head who led the defense in tackles? Yeah, Landon Collins. Landon Collins. He's a good linebacker. He is. He is a pretty good linebacker. He plays that position fairly well. Mm -hmm. Davis was fourth. Um, yeah, Jamin, good... he's, he's starting to come on. That was encouraging to see. He's looks like he's playing faster and he, and he's with some attitude. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to be good. I just think he was a slow starter. And the, the other guy that I was impressed with, and you aren't going to see this on the stat sheet this week is chase young. The guy did a lot of things to make his teammates better mm -hmm. this week. Uh, and he had one play that just was that, that play where he got the hand out to the side, knocked that ball down. That tight end had, 30 or 40 yards out yeah. in front of him. He, nobody was good. He was gone. Uh, I mean, I don't think he was going to the house, but that was a big gainer and, and it was all chase young. I mean, he, he just kind of shook himself free of the right tackle and knocked that ball down, but there were three or four plays. I watched guys nearly get or actually get to Rogers 
because Chase Young had two guys not just not just engaged, but he was pushing them out of the way so somebody else could get in there to get to Rodgers. I felt like Chase, this is this is one of the best games I've ever seen Chase play. And that includes some of the, the highlight reel games from last year, right? Um, well, he just, you, also, you also have Sweat forces a fumble, gets a sack, uh, is in on a couple others. Um, well, the defense changed. Don it's Allen a- had two sacks. I mean, we were all over – we were all over them. Yeah, Sweat all also had that had that should have been a sack, but Aaron Rodgers just, oh my gosh, that he and Rodgers stood around and laughed about afterwards because neither of them thought he was getting away. Is that the one he ended up scrambling for seventeen on third and eleven? Yes. Yeah, but but because Sweat nearly jumped over him, right. <laughs> didn't convert. Mm-hmm. I want to say this: um, it's I, I don't think it's a coincidence that our defense arguably played their most solid game of the season. The, w- one of the impressions that I took away from Sunday is a big reason for that is we played pretty good complimentary football. I know we only put up 10 points. I know that the offense is probably not going to be proud of that, but we got more first downs in Green Bay. We had more time of possession. Uh, we had long drives. Yeah, many more yards than them. It's... Football is the ultimate team game. And I think for probably the first time this year, we played really good football where the both sides, offense and defense complemented one another. Um, Hopefully that translates into some results uh, down the line, but I really think it's something to build off of moving forward. And notice we haven't mentioned a defensive back at all. And that's a good thing. Well, I was just getting to that because I want to, I wanted to mention Danny Johnson. You know, I'll tell you what, the guy put on a clinic for open field tackling this weekend, and that's something we've struggled with. Uh, and and he, I don't, I don't think he missed a tackle in the open field. And, and he didn't just wait on the guys to come to him. He closed on the ball, which was just so good to actually see. I hope he keeps getting some play in time. You know, I don't know what's going to happen once Jackson comes back, but. I think he forced one of those fumbles also. Um, I think that was Danny Johnson that forced one of those fumbles. Well, I haven't I haven't gone and looked at coaches film or anything, but it looked to me like like we made some tweaks to the to the scheme too. There were more bodies around the line of scrimmage. Um, it looked like a more active, aggressive and attacking kind of defense, which is probably yeah. not a bad idea against a guy like Rogers to get him off his block. They they looked like they were they, like they were more on the same page. There was some gap control that's been badly missing. Um, it's I know we're talking about moral victories here, right? We we lost we lost by two touchdowns, but dot dot dot. It was kind of a fluky game where it probably should have been a one score game at the at the very worst. So yeah, the defense is coming on, and if they if they double down on that this coming week. And we we're starting to see the defense come around. The rest of the season could be interesting. Nice Agreed. segue, Mark. <laughs> well, the season the season changes a little bit. I mean, we still have the Buccaneers looming, but the next week, obviously, we got the Broncos in front of us. Uh, they they are not a good football team. That is a game that we should absolutely be competitive in. And if we if this was Week One, I think we all pick us to win by double digits, right? I'll tell you what, if, if Antonio Gibson doesn't have nearly a career game this weekend, I, I watched, I watched the game, the Denver Cleveland game tonight. The guy Johnson. that was, yeah. And, and to Ernest Johnson, who was, who Ernest, was working yeah. on a fishing boat six weeks ago, you know, was so much just team, no. piling up the yards. I mean, and he had massive holes to run through. And I don't think the Denver offensive line is any better than ours, even without Scherf and, and, and Cosme. I don't think that I don't think that the, the Cleveland line rather is any better than ours. Now, Cleveland has established an identity. They are a running team and everybody knows it. And they're going to come out and beat you up and then pass the ball. Uh, but I, I feel like Gibson should have an amazing game this week. And for that matter, so should McKissick. So, so I don't do a lot of stats, but I went and looked at stats about the Broncos. I, I went in thinking, okay, I'm thinking this is one team we're going to stack up. Well, maybe even in the numbers. 
and I'm not going to run down all of them, but the one, Bob, that goes to what you were just talking about, the Broncos, even after the, the Browns game, have the eighth best run defense statistically in the league. We're 10th. We're 10th at 105. They're, they give up 86. Uh, the numbers don't look great. Their total defense is fifth in the league. Yep. We are 29th. Their pass defense is 10th. We're last. And their scoring defense is fourth at 18 points a game. We are last at 30. So I, I agree this looks and feels like a game, but that, that Washington, particularly if they play like they did against the Packers, should do well in. Denver doesn't have the record to show for it, but their units are pretty, are pretty stout on both sides. According have you to looked the numbers. at their schedule? Are those stats padded a little bit by having not, open Eric. season against the Giants, Jaguars, and Jets? That is Giants, absolutely a factor. Jags, absolutely a Jets, factor. Ravens and, and something else and Raiders. That, that they talked heavily about the other night. And, and I feel like I don't know the timing on all this. I'm just going off the feel of the conversation. But it felt like it's it's become it's a building problem, not a not a been a problem since day one but maybe it's become a problem in the last three or four weeks. These guys are signing linebackers off the street, not to the practice squad, but to the 53. Mm -hmm. They've got like five linebackers on IR. And two they, have guys four, in... they have four linebackers on their injury list for this week. That's not the IR guys. Those are the guys. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. They've got, you know, they're, I hate so, to hear that, you know, I mean, so the linebacking core in Denver has just been absolutely decimated. Well, if, if, those guys were all starters at the beginning of the season and they were playing lights out against lousy competition. And then suddenly they start dropping like flies and you've got to play Baltimore with Lamar Jackson and, you know, Pittsburgh with N N Najee. What's his face? Harris. Yeah. The Bama back. That's bigger than a truck. Um, <laughs> Derrick you know. Henry White. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just, I, I don't know. I, the, the Denver, the Denver defense that I watched the other night against Cleveland didn't look like it was fifth in the league on rushing. I, the holes were big enough. I could have run through them. I'm old and slow now. So I guess, I guess the question is, was that a Cleveland thing or was that a Denver thing? Well, great question. Yeah. Don't know. So yeah. I don't think their defense has been the problem this year, even though they haven't lived up to their um, stats. Haven't equaled wins. Like you would sometimes hope, but, um, a defense yep. with the kind of stats they have would equal wins. And that's because their offense, even though they've got Teddy Bridgewater, who statistically is, is having a pretty good year. year. He's like 70% completion rate, um, way more touchdowns than um, interceptions, but they're just not moving the ball. Their offense is like 20. Let's see. They're 16th ranked on passing yards, 18th ranked in rushing yards, but they're only 27th in the league on third downs and they're 28th in red zone efficiency. So they're they're not a terrible offense. And I kind of heard um, I heard a couple of former players on the radio today talking about how they're the league's best rushing offense that refuses to rush the ball. Um, I, you know, I know a couple of Washington football fans that would argue against that. <laughs> there's a couple well, they're of in the conversation. There's a couple you know, of in other words, they're, built, they're built as a big rushing attack offense and let's face it for the most part they always have been built that way but pat Shermer refuses i mean he and i know scott turner gets a lot of heat for not running the ball but um they, the, one of the one of the players on the radio said that uh, pat Shermer sees him go down by three and he thinks it's three touchdowns and starts you know uh, passing the ball all over the field so well, i mean we're, we're have, a... sorry john they've given up 21 sacks which um doesn't bode well when you're going to drop your quarterback, you know, uh, back to pass uh, three times for every time you rush it. I just think, so I think that's, I don't know how we're going to do against their defense, but our offense should eat them. Excuse me. I don't know how our offense is going to do, um, but our defense should eat them alive. Well, they are not going to run the ball this week either. We're, we are the 30th, 32nd ranked pass defense in the league. We are as bad as it gets in the NFL. Um Hold on. There's a Before there's a reason. Further, there's I a reason argue. the Packers ran it 15 times, right? You, you throw against Washington until until I could, I could argue though. 
as equally bad as their competition has been, we have faced the opposite in oh, good yeah. competition. Oh, yeah. They have not faced Pat Mahomes, Justin Herbert, uh, Aaron Rodgers. You know, they're not facing. Agreed. So I, I wonder I wonder if over the next – well, no, because then we got, we got Tampa, then we got Carolina, then we got Dallas, and then Dallas twice in three weeks. You know, so we, we, we're probably not going to make hay there. But I, I don't I don't know that we're going to – not to not to rescind on the Green Bay game, but the two touchdowns that Aaron Rodgers threw were just. There's only four quarterbacks in the NFL that make that throw, you know what I mean, and complete it. The, the throw to Lazard, and then the um, <coughs> who was it? Was it uh, the tight end that went did it, that was in the end zone? That, or there was a couple. Now I can't even think about it and remember. But there were a couple throws. Not many guys make that. So I wonder if Bridgewater can't make that throw. How much different of a of a look we're talking about? Oh, uh, he threw to even attempt it to Tanya and whoever the hell Tanya is. The tight end, right end. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think Bridgewater's. I think we're getting a quarterback that our defense is going to like facing this time because, and I think Bridgewater's a decent quarterback. Um, he can throw the ball, but he's not an electric rusher. He's not. He doesn't rush much at all. And he tends to stay in the pocket and he's not one of those super quick release quarterbacks. So he's going to be a sitting duck to a certain extent, more so than like Justin Herbert or Aaron Rodgers or some of the other quarterbacks that we've had to face so far. We are going to have opportunities to get them off the field. I think our first and second down defense, I meant I meant to look at the splits and I haven't done it yet. We're pretty solid on first and second downs every week. It's third downs where we continue to get crushed. We're still last in the league on third down conversions, we will have opportunities to shut them down this week with Bridgewater in the pocket. Uh, We're going to have to get on him and, and then tackle. I think if if we can allow 40% third down conversions instead of 60 for one week, uh, I think, I think we win this game. But, but was it, was it on the podcast or the radio that I heard someone say, you know, I'd rather us face a third and third and three than a third and eight. It yeah, doesn't seem to make any difference as far as I can tell. We can face third and 17, and we're just watched, as likely to give it up. That's, yeah. In this exact game, third and eight, we gave it up. And on the same drive, it was third and three, and we stopped them. And I had to chuckle. So, uh, yeah. I, 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 we're bad on third down. We are so bad on third and long that we're, like, ranked 32nd and 33rd in this league. I mean, that's that's how bad we are on third and long. Yep. Mark, you're absolutely right. I would much rather – or maybe it's Derek. I'd much rather see third and three than, than third and eight, third and ten, third and 15, because we just don't – we just don't seem to be able to keep the ball in front of us. So I have, the, I have the random stat of the week – if you guys uh, want to take a crack at it, who do you think their two their two leading tacklers of the Denver Broncos are in 2021? And, and I'll give you a hint. It goes to something Bob said a, a little while ago. Well, the only defensive guy I could name off the top of my head is Von Miller. So and I'm guessing it's not him or you wouldn't have he's asked. Been, he's been hurt. The it's safeties. two safeties. It's Kareem Jackson and Justin Simmons are their mm-hmm. leading tacklers. Yep. So that tells you they're vulnerable in the middle there. Well, I'm okay if, if – if they're the leading tacklers, we're probably beyond the line of scrimmage on most rushes. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I, th- I think a big thing, Go ahead, Paul. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I think a big thing that we have to uh, remember and something that we should really be feeling good about uh, going into this game against Denver, we've come off two straight weeks where we've played Kansas City and Green Bay, two teams that easily uh, – could have met each other a year ago in the Super Bowl. And let's be honest, the play here or there, Green Bay would have been playing uh, Kansas City in that game. The fact is, against those two teams, with less than average quarterback play, I would say, in our part, going up against pretty elite quarterbacks in Aaron Rodgers and Patrick Mahomes, we played six and a half out of our last eight quarters of football fairly decently. We were right there with Kansas City until the middle of the third quarter. We hung with Green Bay for four quarters. I think this is a perfect opportunity this week going into Green Bay against Teddy Bridgewater. And uh, sorry, not into going into Green Bay, going into Denver against Teddy Bridgewater. Um, I, I think we can really make some hay this coming Sunday. 
we need to if we're gonna, gonna say. do anything about this season we yeah. should talk about what we think i know this happened on the this came up on the board and i haven't weighed in on it yet somebody asked a very good question where are we right now at two and five and as far as the 2021 season john um my my quick take on that is if we beat denver and find a way to get back within a game or two of 500, you know, with, with six games to go, I still think it's a potential playoff season because, you know, Dallas might do Dallas or, or our guy Dak might go down. Um, we can't give up on the season and start see, looking at the young guys and all that. I think you're still playing for a possible playoff on the, by the same token. If we, if, if I'm equally as interested at this point in seeing us progress we saw some progress against Green Bay. It's the first time I saw what looked like life from this defense and some aggression and some discipline from the defense, despite giving up the third down conversions. They were better. Uh, if we continue that going into this week, win or lose against Denver, if we win, maybe we still, this season is still going on and there's something to play for. If we lose, but we still play well, I'm really going to be okay with that because I don't. I'm not looking at this as a championship contention season anyway i never was i'd really like to see us pick up exactly where we left off against denver fix some of the red zone issues and play a tough game on the road don't beat ourselves don't don't let's not be talking about flukes again next week about how we lost a game um i want you guys love watch ted lasso <laughs> he doesn't really care about the wins and losses he's trying to make men it anyway uh, I don't care about wins as losses as as much this year because I didn't go into it thinking it was, it was a championship type year. I want to see us play hard, con rough, basic football and get the details right little by little. So that was a ramble. That's all I have to say about. Well, let that. me let me ask you then. Hold on, before we go any further, speaking from a macro, a macro, pull the lens back a little bit. Take away top five defense. Take away expectations take away all of the things that we were in year two coming off a three and 13 season where we had the number two pick in the draft with an offensive coordinator who is literally only coordinated 20 games in his entire career we are on our sixth quarterback in that time frame I are see we where you're really going. Are we really surprised we're at this point? Like, honestly, take away all of the expectations that we had inflated. If we could rewind, go back to the beginning of last year, and then they told you we would have our sixth starting quarterback, and we would be where we are now, would you be shocked? Not with the record. The only thing that is that shocked me early in the season was how inept we looked defensively and just disorganized. That that I'm still trying to figure out. It looks to me like they're starting to figure it out, at least based on what I saw this week. But no, Derek, it, it's the right question. I, I think we are. I think I bought into it almost as much as anybody that the defense was going to be the second ranked defense in the league. Well, there were people telling us last year, yeah, but look at who we faced in those four games we won in a row. The quarterbacks we were facing weren't Rodgers and Mahomes and Brady and guys like that. We made some hay against lesser teams. I'd like to see us make hay against some lesser teams this year again. Let's not be those guys. Let's beat Denver. Let's beat Carolina when we play Carolina. Um, if Dallas comes in playing like they have been, we're not going to beat Dallas. As they, they are better right now than we are. And if you're if we're keeping it real, not to make excuses for this team, but so far in seven games, seven weeks, we've lost our starting tight end, who was our top offensive weapon last year. We lost our our second uh, offensive weapon last year, McClure. If you say so, but I think for I mean I'm I'm just talking as far as for the position, the impact of having him at that position. Um, we lost our top draft pick um, to injury Cosme not saying that's a game changer but he is our starting um, guard and then we also lost our top free agent acquisition um, in Samuel our top two free agent acquisitions our quarterback yes. and our wide receiver yes we've lost both of them for 
seemingly for the season. I don't know about Samuel. We'll see what happens there. But and, and the I mean, that's only, a lot. That's a lot of stuff to absorb when you're not good. Well, that circles good. back, right? If if we have a couple of those guys on offense, if we have Logan Thomas healthy on Sunday against the Packers, and we had if had, we have sure, if we have, you know, Thomas. that game might have ended differently. That's what I was referencing earlier. I would like to have seen us have not one hand tied behind our back offensively. Yeah. I guess this explains – we all knew Dallas was going to be good. We all had a feeling the Giants and the Eagles were going to struggle. <clears throat> I guess this is the ultimate testimony that we love this team so much that we uh, we want to believe a lot of things that might not be yeah. realistic at times. Well, I wish – I'm. go ahead, Bob. Oh, well, I, you know, I was just going to say, I mean, there's no reason to not continue to think that playoffs are a possibility. Are we going to win the NFC East? No, probably not. I, I, unless Dallas just implodes. And by implodes, I mean, it's pretty much going to take an injury to Prescott again, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's pretty well, much what it's going to take at, at this point. Um, but, I mean, I'm looking at the rest of the, the rest of the NFC at the moment, and in all honesty – only the West is really competitive with the Cardinals and the Rams, right? The Cardinals at, at seven and seven and, and ought and the Rams at six and one. There's a two game difference or more in every other con or every other division. And there's three wild card teams this year. Right? And there, yeah, there's three. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mean, Minnesota's at three and three, they're in second place in the North. All right. New Orleans is at four and two and they've got a, they've got a tiebreaker over us, but I mean, I'm just I'm looking at this and all right. So the Rams or the cards are going to get the top wild card spot. I think that's pretty much a given. Whoever doesn't win that that division, but you know, I'm looking at the rest of these, and if we get hot, there's no reason we can't finish ahead of the Vikings, the Saints. You know, I believe I believe as it stands today, I heard that we're a game and a half out of the wild card, which is pretty incredible with two wins. But it is early, it's still early. The, the point at which I'm going to get concerned with this team um, and where they are in terms of their development is when we start losing to the likes of the Eagles, the Giants, Denver, who's upcoming. Denver is, you know, going downhill at this point. They won their first three. They've lost four in a row. Uh, same thing with Carolina. They're going backwards. When we start losing to those teams who are at our level, or lower than us or lesser than us, so to speak. That's when I'm going to get concerned about uh, the direction that Ron Rivera is bringing this team in. Uh, sure, I would like to see this team be competitive against, you know, the stronger and more elite teams in the league. And it can be argued that we haven't been very competitive against some of them, for instance, Buffalo. But the fact is, again, I, I said it before, six, our last six and a half quarters, or six and a half out of our last eight quarters against Kansas City and Green Bay, we weren't that bad. Eventually, we're going to steal a game from from one of these bigger teams. Well, it's not that we weren't even that bad. We led a good portion of that. We had a lead in the third quarter, into the fourth quarter against, or at halftime against the uh, the Chiefs. Correct. Yeah. And it, in all honesty, either one of these last two games, if we'd won them, I wouldn't call them a steal, Paul. I would. I we played well enough in both of these last two games that. Had we hung on and won, I, I feel like it was a legit, you know. Um, it's We're not beating like a, ourselves now, right now, yeah. the last couple weeks, more than the other team imposing it's, their will on us. We're beating ourselves. With, with the Chiefs game, you felt it when he missed the field goal, and then they went right back down the, the field. They drove down and scored. Then we threw the ball three times. They got the ball back. After we had had just the most methodical rushing drive you've ever seen in your life. And then you follow that up with this past weekend, where again we're in the red zone twice and we come away with zero points. Yeah, and so, we come out. We come out in the second half. We give up the ball and let them score a touchdown. That's when I knew that I'm like, every this is it. You know, this is what we do. So while well, to circle back around, yes, you can. I, I believe Scott Turner called a good game. There was a lot left out there. He called a well enough game to win, but there was more that could have been done to compensate for what you would all believe is to us being up against a superior opponent, but well, I, Ron I, I Rivera, sorry. No, go ahead, Bob. I got random thoughts jumping into my head. Ron Rivera was talking about, he was asked about why if Taylor was, was high on so many balls 
and he was talking about it throwing off his back foot and a mechanics thing. I, I'm, I went back and watched the condensed version of the game. I've watched it twice now. If Taylor is a foot lower on like six balls in that game, we ain't losing. He was for some reason, and it's not, it, I think it's a couple of weeks in a row. I assume this is a correctable thing. It's a mechanics thing or it's, you know, he is He's this, playing Aaron Rodgers he in is Green this, Bay. No, his, Aaron Rodgers his didn't make team. His, Aaron Rodgers didn't, didn't go under 120 the whole game, the whole day. John, Aaron, uh, Aaron Rodgers didn't make Taylor Heineke throw the ball too high. I know. I'm saying though, did you see? Did you see Heineke's eyes and facial expression through he's most a, of that game? He's he a good-looking like, man. He looked wound up. I'm telling you, he was. I'm just saying. I think it's a lot of it's adrenaline. If you and I'm just, saying this, this has to be fixable. My, I, I'm actually. Def- I'm saying a good thing here. We're not far away. Mm-mm. Well, they, we're not goes, far away. This goes back to was it week two where where um, DeAndre Carter was running alone down the middle of the field, and, uh, and we didn't see him. Didn't see him, yeah. and he throws a 19 yard ball to Deami Brown. Still got the first down. But so he's learning. The kid is learning, I and mean, we 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 remind ourselves of this every week, right? How many starts does he have in the NFL? Well, the, again, a, I circle back to like if we're taking a macro picture of this, we're talking about literally the fourth. I mean, you could argue the second or third rookie quarterback that we've played out of the last six starters. You know what I'm saying? We're talking some infants in the NFL. And one other point I want to throw out to you, and I'm not saying I want to bench Heineke. I think he's earned the opportunity to try to win the starting job. But everybody forgets, where is Kyle Allen? Kyle well, we Allen. know where he is, brother. We know where he is. But if you put him, if you pull Ty Taylor now, that's gonna that sends a, a really big message to the team. I'm not sure Rivera's ready to do that. They know. So they on. know. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying we need to pull Heineke and name Allen the starter. But if you find yourself in a position like we did against Kansas City, where Heineke throws two just egregious interceptions. What, what, well, I think I think when he does sit him down, that'll be it. I don't think he's going to – I don't think he'll switch quarterbacks back and forth. I have a hard time imagining that. I'm, I mean, I'm which, with you, though. We talked about this the last time that I was on. I'd love to see Kyle play, but I'm not ready to see Heineke sit down yet. I like the spark that he has with the offense. I like – I mean, look what we did. We gained 400-plus yards on the road in Green Bay. All we didn't do was finish. And I have, I have no guarantee that Kyle Allen takes us up and down the field like Taylor Heineke did on Sunday. You know, I, uh, so I'm looking at Heineke stats for the year. I, I'm not unimpressed. You know, he's 151 for 235. That's a 64.3% completion rate. I can think of some recent quarterbacks that have played quite a bit for us. We would have loved to have had a 64% completion rate out of, you know, he's got six, almost 1700 yards in the bank. He's averaging 7.1 yards per attempt. That's, that's better than we've done in, in, you know, since Cousins in 2016 or something. Um, he's throwing for 268 yards a game. He's got 10 touchdowns against seven interceptions, and you can argue that he's had a couple of touchdowns dropped. Now, you can also argue that the other teams have dropped a couple of well, you could solid. also argue the interception he threw against the Chiefs was about a freak ass th- play like you'd never seen before, where the guy pins the ball against the defender's back. But you know, he exactly, yeah. You know, he's only given up nine sacks, and and the guy's only got well, he's played, he's got six games, seven games played, but he's only started seven games in his career, eight games in his career. If if I've said this in previous pods, I'll probably end up saying it again this year. If he were a first round draft pick, none of us would be blinking at this. I think they really like him. <clears throat> and I think they I think they're smart enough. I don't think they they were wed to him at all, like the first couple of games, but I think what they recognize, uh, sp- specifically Rivera, is that the players l- love playing for him. They do. Uh, it may not always result in good things. But you can just you can just feel it, and you could feel it in that game last weekend. You could just feel that you know what he's not intimidated. And the thing I do love about him is he'll go out there and throw the worst god awful pass for a pick <laughs> you've ever seen, and he comes right back out and starts slinging it again. He's not phased even for a second, and I just love that about him. And I I'd, I'd rather lose 
with him than Kyle Allen. <laughs> I don't know if that's yeah. I wasn't I wasn't saying I wasn't saying that we need to bench him for Kyle Allen. But my point was And I like Kyle Allen. I'm my point just, was Kyle Allen earned us well, was given a starting opportunity in Carolina. He was given a starting opportunity here. And it's like he has just been written off at this point. And I still want to see a couple more games out of Heineke. Why do you think I, he's been written off, Derek? What makes you think he's been written off? Because Heineke has made some decisions that are no worse than what we saw last year, and people got benched for Allen to play. Uh, yeah, just, what I'm hearing is you're comparing him to, to Haskins' brief career here. Well, we're talking about how much different is he than what Haskins was last year. Ooh, I I'm think just he's talk, a lot different. Uh, I'm not talking Haskins about ability. Was. I'm talking about tenure. I'm talking about games played. I'm talking about production. I'm talking about ability to win a football game. Yeah, no, right. I go believe ahead, me. Well, I was I was just gonna say. So I I pulled up Allen from last year. Right, he played four games last year. He was sixty for eighty seven with a sixty nine percent completion rate, seven yard average per per attempt, but only one hundred and fifty nine yards per game. He had four TDs against one INT and seven sacks. Total rating of 99.3. Not well, he terrible. didn't start all four of those games. I think he came in late and then he left early in the fourth, uh, early in the first quarter of his fourth game when Jabril Peppers went through his leg and broke it. I think, I think part of it is, and again, I know you're not arguing to Ben Chinicky right now. I get that. I think part of it is he has not looked great this year. He didn't look great in preseason, he didn't look great in camp. He was Ooh, limping Alan? still. Yeah, he was so, still limping. Well, and that's camp. true. The injury could so be. I, I don't think they, I don't think they want to put him out there unless it just becomes, a, you know, a total. Well, so none of us want to see Kyle Allen start on on Sunday against no, Denver. No, no, no. I'm just I mean, asking where. where if, well, if, but let me ask you this: If Heineke is struggling in the third quarter and we're down by ten points and he's just having an awful day, would I be really, really upset if? He brought Kyle Allen off the bench to see if it could spark something. No, not for a two and five team, maybe trying to save a season. And that was my point. Yeah. That was I, where so I mean, if, I mean, yeah, I don't think Kyle, uh, Taylor, Taylor Heineke hasn't nailed down the starting position right now. I think, I think in the, in the coaches minds, he's still giving us the best option to win right now, based on all the things we've been talking about. Um, if we lose on Sunday, and we're heading into the bye at a two and six and all that, uh, we should talk more. I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of seeing Kyle Allen start against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. At, at, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, I, but, I think, and um, I don't know, this may be me. I may be completely alone in this, but I, I think one of the reasons that you see Heineke continue to, to hold this job down, not, have anything to do with the way the players think about him but i don't ever remember seeing a quarterback's game change as much from week to week to week as heineke's you can see him working on things literally watch it happen on the field and i'm not saying you see a season's worth of worth of stuff in a week but things that you comment on this week next week he does differently maybe it's not better but he does it differently. You can see him working on his game in a way that I never saw Griffin work. If Griffin had his ability to work on his game, Griffin would still be playing in this league. Yeah. Taylor's a smart quarterback. You know, I, I he, he's a natural quarterback. He's kind of a little bit of a sandlot guy. And I like that. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he needs to work on his Lambo leap a little bit though. I was a little shaky. Did, well, well, he needs to not do it until they actually <laughs> say it's officially a touchdown. Uh, I don't know, oh, man. and he's going to have to, and, and in all seriousness, we've talked about what, I mean, I'm certainly have been beating the drum. I think his biggest limitation is I don't think he's got a big time NFL arm. And I think that hurts him in, in downfield plays. I just, I think he struggles to get the ball there where he needs to. Um, but he can, he can get better. John talked about this in one of the earlier pods by anticipating. I mean, Joe, Joe Montana didn't have the biggest arm either, but he threw the ball three seconds before anybody else knew what he was doing. He threw it to a spot. If Taylor has that kind of moxie, and I haven't seen anything to indicate he doesn't, that he could grow into that role despite the limited arm. 
it's well, gonna be a, we're gonna have to go through the growing process we're gonna have to suffer through it i think well, the biggest we, thing getting in, in his way is himself and i mentioned this on the board we have seen at least two possibly three wheel routes where the wide receiver had a step on the defender and the ball landed at the inner pylon and got intercepted Whereas mm-hmm. if he would have put it at the back pylon of the end zone, there's only one person that can catch the mm-hmm. ball. Well, that and pick in the 25, end zone this week was that way. It was yep. just These underthrown. are 25 to 30 yard throws. These are not throws that are outside mm-hmm. of his ability. Right. These are not 60 yard passes downfield. These are not, you know, the ultimate arm. So that is where my concern is, is, is when is he going to get that part of not – not being restricted by his arm, but understanding his arm and knowing that Adam Humphreys was open at the 15 yard line, put the ball at the back pylon and let him run under it. Don't throw I, it to the I front pylon. If he's, huh? I wonder if he's being overcoached a little bit. And I, and I'll tell you why I say that because one week you've got Rivera saying he, um, he needs to game not manager. Take off. when he said he that to not take cold. off. He needs to stay in the pocket and go through his, the next week. He's saying he needs to take off more and be his natural follow his natural instincts. And it just makes me think at times like, okay, you got the offensive coordinator who's telling you, you know, you're a young quarterback, you're an inexperienced quarterback. You've got a quarterback's coach probably talking to you. You've got Rivera uh, talking to him, I'm sure. I just wonder if maybe he's at the point where he just needs to tune some of that out and just say, I know how to play this position. I'm going to play it. Hey, welcome to the NFL, man. Every NFL quarterback trying to get started is getting all those voices in his ear. You either handle the pressure or you don't. I think you saw some of that this week, though, with at Green Bay, John. That 38-yard run was all Taylor, and, and he he recognized the amount of space that he had and made a decision to just go run the ball early. He wasn't under any pressure. He had time to stand there and, and find a receiver, but he saw what amounted to a, you know, a, a mile of green grass and went, hey, you know, this looks like a really good idea, and off he went and did his thing, and what was that? The the would they say the the third longest run by a quarterback at Lambo in Lambo history? Was it Lambo history? Yeah, I think so. That makes sense. Um, you know, and and so I think we're seeing some of that. Some of Taylor going, eh, I got a game to play. I'm gonna go do my thing. But he's finding that balance between doing his thing and standing in the pocket because you know, last year he did his thing a little too early, a little too fast. And, and early in the season, maybe a little early and too fast. And now he's, he's reading through his progressions. He's finding the guy. He's not necessarily crossing the line of scrimmage immediately. He's, he's drifting right and left and looking for somebody. And then he makes a decision, unless it's obvious. And then he just goes and does his thing. And I don't know. I, I, I like the game he played with the exception of like two plays this week. One of them was that wheel route, and the other one was diving in front of the end zone. I, yeah, I but even he made that just, decision and he had a clear touchdown and he just <laughs> he brain farted. Yeah, he just and and high throws. There were there were two high throws in the end zone that, that are touchdowns if he gets it a foot lower. Yeah, that's true. I, I yeah, but wondering. hold on, but to, but to argue the the, the overcoaching, is he thinking in his mind, I gotta put this where only my guy can get it and nobody else can touch it? Not on those two passes, not on the ones I saw, Derek. I, I hear you, but these were guys, he's got his guy in front of the defender and the ball's just too high for him to make a play on. Now, they're not easy throws. I mean, he's got somebody in his face and he's going off his back foot. But so, an NFL quarterback needs to make those throws. And to Mark's point, it's not just the high throws. He he needs to learn when not to get his receivers decapitated. That's I don't true. know. Yeah, how there many were a couple he, of those. There were at least three or four, including one to McLaurin, where the defender is about to take the receiver's head off. You can see it coming, and he throws the ball, and boom. I mean, we're lucky we didn't have more fumbles than we did. Um, but I, I think that's one of those things that he's got to learn. Like, yeah, you might be able to get it to him, but you can't set your guys up like that. And that'll come with experience, right? I mean, that'll come with experience. So so this is a big game. This this. And for the 2021 season and the competitive portion of it, you feel this is a like really a, big game for the team. Kind they of need a to win, point, right? Yeah, kind they of need to win point. this one. Vic Fangio is playing for his job. He 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 might not make it through the season if he keeps it up. Um, so it's a big game for for both teams. So real quick, what do you what do you guys think is going to happen? I'm gonna I'm gonna go reverse order. I'm gonna go Paul first. So I think uh, we are ultimately going to win this game um 
there are two things that make me somewhat concerned, but I, at the end of the day, I don't think they're big things. Uh, one being that the Broncos are going to be, uh, I guess, inducting or honoring Peyton Manning into their ring of honor uh, prior to the I game. I did not know that. Uh, the, other, um, the, the other item being that Denver obviously has uh, 10 days of rest having played a Thursday night game. So they've had a lot of preparation time for us. Um, I don't like those two aspects, but at the end of the day, I don't think they're uh, major things. These two teams to me, in a lot of ways, mirror each other. Um, they're both teams that have been searching for a quarterback for a little bit of time now. Um, we played Bridgewater a year ago. He threw for under 200 yards against us. He didn't really hurt us. Uh, all of his yardage came through dink and dunk passes to Curtis Samuel. If you guys remember last year in that uh, Carolina game, I think McCaffrey our defense destroyed us, didn't he? Uh, he, he may have as well. Um, I, I think our defense can feast on them. They they've been getting a little bit of their swagger back, especially along that defensive line. And we really, really need this game. Opposing quarterbacks are posting a 108.3 passer rating against Denver. Um, and I really think that, that Heineke can have a solid game this coming weekend. Um, I ultimately think we're going to go in there and make a statement and I've been saying it for a long time. I think that Washington is going to be a team that is ultimately a second half team. We're still a team in the growth process. We have to learn how to win these games against teams that are our, at our level. Um, and we've done a pretty solid job of doing that under Rivera. Um, it's, it's the big teams that we struggle against. I think we're going to go in there and win 30 to 17. 30 to 17. I was wrong. McCaffrey did not play in that game. That was the game Heineke came in and kind of had his coming out party where he, he kind of flashed towards the, uh, he had 137 yeah. yards and a touchdown passing in like, uh, less than a quarter and a half. John, what do you well, got? I think. I think both teams have, uh, at least based on the last couple of weeks, they have equally good defenses. So I don't think it's going to be a total shootout. I think Bridgewater can be exposed. I think our offense is going to – is much better than theirs, even with Heineke um, <clears throat> doing his Jekyll and Hyde thing a little bit. So I was going to say 17 to 10 good guys, but I'm going to bump it up 23 to 10 because I think the defense is going to get some turnovers in this game. Ooh. I would take 23 to 10. But I am worried. I, I will say I'm worried because the Broncos are more desperate than we are because their coach's job is. Yeah, but are they, are they broken? That's the thing. Have they passed desperation? I don't know that it no. matters. I don't know. I don't know if uh, the ghost of Peyton Manning can save them um, next Sunday or not, but. <laughs> like All right. Mark, what do you got? Um, I think this game it comes down to the fourth. I think it comes down to the fourth quarter. Um, two pretty evenly matched teams. I think we are. My sense of the roster is about top to bottom. Is is this is a game on a neutral field? We should win. It's not a neutral field. We are playing at altitude, and the, our conditioning in the fourth quarter and our ability of guys like like our big interior linemen and all that to continue to pressure late in the game at the altitude in a close game, I think they'll probably be the key. Um, the only thing I've been right about in football all year so far this year is picking Washington. I've been, I have picked all seven games correctly and I felt very sure about all of them. I am not sure about this one. This is the first one I'm not sure about. So I am choosing to believe that what I saw from our defense against the Packers and what I saw from the offense against the Packers and by that, I mean, not only did they go up and down the field sort of at will, but they shot themselves in the foot in the red zone in a way that was kind of freakish. I don't think that happens again. I think we find a way to pull this one out um, based on the defense rising up in the fourth and making up in the fourth quarter, making a couple of plays. But I don't think it's going to be it's a comfortable win. I think we are going to wait and win it in the last two minutes. And I'm, I'm looking at 27-23. All right. Duh. All right. What do you got there, Bob? 
I, I, I was that was that English? If Denver, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was, it was if, Texas. If, were, if it were this Denver team, but it were played at sea level, I wouldn't have any qualms about saying, you know, Washington's going to win this game. That's that's my, my you know my my big qualm. Denver is a tough out at home. They always have been. Even when they have a lousy team, they're a tough out at home. I still think Washington finds a way to win this. And I think Washington finds a way to win this off the strength of, I think this is a week we come away going, our coaching staff finally really stepped up and, and, and did something righteous, right? You know, Mark alluded to the, you know, the altitude problems for our big uglies on the defensive line. I think if our coaching staff is on this, we don't worry about the big uglies on the defensive line because the big uglies on the offensive line are going to be handling everything through the fourth quarter. We're going to run the football. We're going to milk the clock. We're going to just beat somebody up. We're going to expose a, right. a hurt, a hurt linebacking core. Um, Cause I tell you what, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a defensive line in the league that our offensive line cannot line up and, and, and play against. It's these teams that have great linebackers behind defensive lines that, that shut our running game down. And Denver didn't have that at the moment. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to say 28, 14 in a game that is closer than the score, because I think we put up a couple of late touchdowns. I think we do to Denver, what green Bay and Kansas city have done to us for the last two weeks. And it's a tight game through three, you know, two and a half, three quarters. And in the fourth quarter, between the defense and the offense, we kind of blow the game open and Denver comes away going, man, we had this right up until, you know, 14 minutes to go in the game. Um, and I'll take it a step further too. I think Mr. John Davis gets his first sack of the year. He was close with Aaron Rodgers at least twice this last week. I think he gets home and, and, and gets Bridgewater this week. All right. Well, I have been battling within myself trying to figure out if this is one of those games that we squeak out like we did with the Giants or if this is one of those games that we find ourselves looking at the third quarter and we're up by 17 points and everybody's excited and happy. And most of us, well, those of us with it, with kids don't get to watch it because we're out trick-or-treating. I am going to say that this is one of those games that we actually win a little bit handily because I think our defense is actually feeling themselves. If we force a couple turnovers and if we find a way not to give up a touchdown on our first drive, because it seems like it hasn't happened in what three years now. And That's we haven't crazy scored talk. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's not crazy to win the game, but scored a touchdown on the opening drive. That's Come on, man. Tough. Keep it real. Washington better ne- better not defer another se- another coin flip <laughs> the rest of the season. I actually think we handle this, and I think we win the game twenty eight to uh, like twenty eight seventeen. And it's similar to Bob. I think we find ourselves. It's even. It's not even that close. It just kind of happens where we we pull away and they get a, like a kind of a gimme touchdown late. You know what I'm saying? So. I'm going to go 28-17 for the good guys. And maybe I'm just trying to will that into existence. I don't know. Will away. So I want to close tonight with an inspirational quote from the great Zig Ziglar, because you guys are so worried about those mountains we're going to be playing in. It's your attitude plus your aptitude equals your altitude. Oh, there you go. I like it. (laughs) I'm drinking tough. Imagine what it would have been if I'd been drinking something strong wait the the jar has been the jar has been reading yeah i just (laughs) oh jesus i just threw a flag for unnecessary eloquence (laughs) (laughs) yeah don't get that don't get that tattooed anywhere especially since you're supposed to be the eloquent one mark yeah i got nothing i got nothing (laughs) oh all right boys it's been all right brothers hail this we better be talking about a win next week Yeah. Here, here. Happy Halloween. Hail. Happy Halloween.